great. I can see people are coming in and, and joining us. So we'll we'll start making moves towards a start here. Welcome everybody who's now joining this latest social science seminar series, Thailand seminar. Um, we've been running these series now for a year or so. We've had lots of great speakers, but this is an event that I've been particularly looking forward to, as I know many people have. We were postponed once, but now it's, it's all really happening. So it's fantastic to have Professor Alan Hicken of the University of Michigan with us. He is a leading scholar of politics of Southeast Asia with a particularly strong interest in Thailand. We, we go back quite a few years and there's a bit of his bio on the, the webpage for this event. And I can put a a, a link in with a little bit more, but I won't spend a great deal of time introducing Alan because he's known to many of us and um, in some respects needs no introduction. So Alan works a great deal, as I said, on, on different aspects of Southeast Asian politics, but with particular reference to parties and elections. And this is particularly topical given that we are coming up. Um, doesn't seem very long since we had the last one, but another Thai election is impending uh, some point in the first half of next year. And we also have some very interesting things happening in Thailand. So there's living an interesting times title that we came up with a while ago. Turns out to be particularly apposite at a moment when the Thai prime minister is suspended from duty and all kinds of very, very interesting things are going on in front of and indeed behind the scenes. So Alan, welcome to the Thailand so Social Science Seminar Series. Thank you and I uh, appreciate the invitation and uh, thanks to you and the folks at the uh, University of Sydney Southeast Asia Center and NIAS and, and the New York Southeast Asia Network. Um, this has been something I've looking, been looking forward to and, and, um, and sort of debating about what, you know, what to talk about. Uh, and um, as, as Duncan implied, there's a lot to choose from with this title. There are lots of dimensions of Thai politics that are extremely interesting. And uh, sort of we think about the last sort of 17 years, um, this has been nothing if but uh, if, if, if nothing but turbulent, right? In in sort of a comparative mm -hmm. sense, and to just give you a sense of the, the the extent of the political instability, by my count, in these last 17 years, Thailand's had uh, five constitutions plus another failed draft, eight soon to be nine uh, national elections or referenda, several party uh, dissolutions, countless large scale protests, two coups, and 11 heads of government. So these are indeed yep. really uh, interesting uh, times. And there's a lot of really good work being done by scholars across numerous disciplines looking at the causes, the consequences, the, uh, the contours of this political instability. Um, uh, and I'm not going to take time to rehash all those details here, but I'm, uh, I would love to chat about that in the Q&A if people are interested. But I want to spend the time, uh, the, the, the few minutes I have talking about some reoccurring patterns or problems or sort of alleged uh, patterns and problems uh, uh, in, uh, in sort of Thai politics. And specifically, I want to talk about um, two, uh, two culprits. Um, uh, two culprits that get uh, blamed by reformers, by conservative actors, even by some scholars uh, uh, for the problems that lie at the heart of Thai politics, uh, particularly the weakness of Thai democracy, and that's namely parties and voters. So th these two culprits are often at the receiving end of criticism about the health, the performance, and even the viability of a democracy in Thailand. And while I'm not going to make the case that the criticisms are completely without merit, I do want to take some time today to kind of, kind of complement or complicate that that narrative as we prepare for sort of upcoming elections uh, in yeah, which does seem to be uh, a, a quick. It just seems like we just had them, but also seems like ten years ago we had them. So I'll be drawing in this in this on some recent work that uh, my own recent work as well as work that I've been doing with Joe Selway over for quite a number of years on the changing pattern of partisan uh, partisanship and, and party identity and parties in Thailand. Um, and so uh, just as a caveat, I'm, I, I'm an institutionalist by training uh, and disposition, um, and I'm, but I'm gonna make the case that by focusing on, by focusing on these two factors, uh, if, uh, to the exclusion of other things, we sort of misdiagnose the problem, we miss the, biggest, the bigger picture. And as a result, attempts to engineer our way to better parties, uh, elections or voters, as Thai reformers are, are wont to do, um, uh, are, are doomed to be uh, disappointed. So um, let's let's just as a bit of background, uh, what have parties sort of historically look like in Thailand? Let me start by, by talking about the period in the 1980s to 1990s, um, where uh, Thai parties, the party system were uh, were blamed and, and rightly so for uh, a variety of perceived uh, shortcomings and failures, from corruption to the 1997 Asian economic crisis. And these criticisms took a lot of took many forms. But let me just uh, sort of summarize them with sort of three common laments, uh, things that you hear you hear a lot of people say, and some of these resonate with uh, criticisms and complaints we hear actually uh, today as well. Um, so here's the first one, uh, the, the, the point, there's just too many parties. Now, what, what the optimal number of parties is, I don't know, but, but there was a sense that the Thailand party system in that era was sort of out of control. 
Uh, so between 1983 and 1996, an average of 15 parties would run in each election, 12 of those would win seats in parliament, five to six would then come together to form the government, and with so many parties, there was no single party that even approached, even sniffed a majority. Uh, the average size of the largest party during that period is about 26% of the seats. Uh, and so Thailand ends up being governed by these large multi-party coalition governments that were notoriously short-lived, right? So between 1978 and 2001, the average duration of a government cabinet was 18 months. So lots of instability, lots of gridlock, lots of uh, necessary policy reforms left undone, as you might expect. Um, the second uh, complaint is that parties are parties in name only. Uh, uh, the, the, these penal parties, right? So they, 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 the high parties are something different than what we would think of a, as a normal healthy party in a, in, a, in, a, in a consolidated democracy. So this takes many forms, but parties aren't cohesive. Uh, they're factionalized. They're weak. Uh, they, they, they're very weak party labels. Voters don't care about uh, uh, party labels. Candidates don't care about party labels. Lots of party switching and, uh, and parties being these sort of short-term ephemeral alliances of convenience with a, so, sort of no, nothing more of substance. And just to give you again a sense of, of what we're talking about there, uh, 43 parties or so um, uh, competed in at least one election between 1979 and 1996. By the time we roll around to 2001, um, uh, there was only 10 that were still around and most parties, uh, the average was, they, they lasted an average of less than three elections and about half of those 43 parties, 20 of them uh, lasted just a single election. Uh, so lots of, just lots of churn, lots of uh, lack of substance in sort of the, the character of those parties. Uh, a third complaint um, uh, is that uh, the, the parties were focused, overly focused, parties and their politicians, uh, provide, providing goodies to very narrow constituencies um, with very little attention to or really even interest in sort of larger com com public good, larger common, uh, um, larger common interests. Uh, so they weren't champions of the public good, they weren't uh, shepherds of the national interest, they or even stationary bandits, right? They were uh, like ants on a sugar cube. Um, uh, and, and lots of uh, lots of discussions of patronage, about vote buying and the like from this period of, of Thai politics. This the sign being a kind of example. This is a sign out of a soy I used to live on in Thailand, where the road got uh, uh, got got repaved one day, and all along the soy were these signs with Kuvanga Kumping wanting to know that the member of parliament that she was responsible for the paving of this road. Right um, now, when when drafters convened to produce a new constitution in 60, uh, 1996, 1997, uh, they were set, they, these, these problems were on their mind and several key reforms were aimed at remaking the, the party system. Um, I can talk more about them in the Q&A if people are interested, I won't go into details, um, but I've written quite a bit about these things. Um, and you know, this, so this includes the new electoral system that Thailand has now become very familiar with, this, this mixed member system with uh, 400 seats uh, uh, from constituency elections and 100 seats from a national uh, party list. Uh, tier, uh, new restrictions on party switching, new powers for the prime minister over members of his, uh, of his, his, his faction, factions of his party. But as a package, these reforms sought to reduce the number of political parties, induce uh, parties to develop identifiable party reputations, and create stronger attachments between parties and candidates and, and parties and their voters. And the effects of the reforms in terms of the number of parties was pretty immediate and, uh, and dramatic. Um, this is one way to sort of uh, calculate that. This chart shows the effective number of parties uh, in Thailand since 1996. Uh, it's a measure that the political science is, scientists use that weights party by size. So big parties count for more. Um, and you can see that this really sharp uh, and noticeable decline in the number of parties from more than seven in 1996, again, measured in a size weighted way, uh, to between two and three by the time we get to 2011. So by the time we get to 2011, in most constituencies throughout the country, we really have a two-party contest. So it's between uh, in 2011, uh, Pua Thai and usually Democrat, occasionally a, a, another smaller regional party. Um, we can also, though, see um, that we uh, see uh, uh, the beginnings of uh, some evidence of beginnings of, of change on the part of voters and party leaders and candidates about how they see uh, their strategy. Um, so the ruling party, for one, uh, Thai Rak Thai, uh, Pua Thai, sticks together. Uh, which was, you know, uh, uh, again, pretty unprecedented. Um, uh, but also political parties led by Thai Rak Thai, but, but echoed by, by, by some other larger parties, begin to move away from relying solely on personal strategies in favor of coordinated party-centered strategies. So parties begin to develop the beginnings of serious policy platforms, actually campaign on those platforms, uh, and, and being a member of particular parties uh, becomes one of the most valuable assets for candidates in, say, 2005, uh, which is a sharp departure from the past, right? Um, uh, this example, again, uh, reflects this, uh, this mix nicely. This is that same road sign, but showing you the bottom, uh, where we actually show that one of the things that Bhuvani Dakumthi wants you to know about is that 
uh, she's a member of the Pak Tai Rak Tai party, right? Um, in the past, uh, a poster like this would either not have the party name at all or have it in really small font because you don't want to confuse voters. Last time you were a member of a different party, next time you might be along to a, even another party. And so let's be sure you know who I am, but the party stuff is just is, is um, really uh, beside the point. Um, so we see another way to sort of look at this is, um, uh, is, um, is to look at uh, data from uh, the Vita Rise the Democracy, Rise Democracy Project, excuse me. Um, uh, and um, uh, this is picking up some of these changes. And, and this is, goes along, I'll talk more about this in just a minute, but this goes along with uh, evidence that we have that voters are also actually becoming more partisan uh, in uh, during this period. Um, and, I'll, and I'll just summarize some of that evidence we found. So candidates uh, during this period who switch parties get punished at higher rates than they had than they were punished at earlier eras. Um, compared to pre-1997, voters become less and less likely to split their votes and more and more likely to cast all their votes for the same party, regardless of which uh, particular set of rules we use. And there is some evidence, so this is more limited uh, in surveys, uh, that voters begin to care more about policy platforms, promises, and reputations of parties than they had in the past. So going back to this, this, this VDEM data that I have here, uh, Variety's Democracy uh, Project collects yearly data on different aspects of political systems, including information about political parties. Um, and one of their measures is this party institutionalization in debt. So it's this sort of kind of a summary estimate of party strength in the system. So individual parties are going to be stronger or weaker, but this gives you a sort of general sense of how coders perceive the party system. So at the sort of lower end, we have uh, zero, which is uh, no institutionalization. All the parties are, are weak. Uh, to one where all the parties are sort of strong, highly institutionalized, et cetera. And I chose the time period here, 1980 to 2018, just before the last election. I can talk about what happens after that with this measure if people are interested. But um, uh, as a baseline, let's start with, uh, we, I, I put Thailand, or, or, sorry, sorry uh, Japan and Malaysia here, both of which have quite strong parties uh, with high levels of institutionalization. Uh, and then at the other end uh, the Philippines, which has some of the weakest parties uh, in the world. So where does Thailand sort of fit in this, uh, in this figure? Um, we can, here it is here. We can argue about how Thailand's coded, whether we agree or disagree with any particular yearly estimate, but a couple of things kind of jump out from the figure. Uh, so uh, in the 1980s and 1990s, Thailand was on par with the Philippines. Among the lowest scores we have in the world, for party institutionalization, for party strength. Uh, but over the late, eight, late, late 1990s and early 2000s, we, we see this sort of dramatic improvement. So still not highly institutionalized in sort of comparative sense, um, uh, but parties uh, and parties had still had lots of problems that we can talk about, but there was certainly a marked change uh, in how parties were organized and, and how they were uh, connecting to, to, to the voters and, and to their candidates. Of course, that change doesn't go without notice. Uh, we've had a we had two coups that were in part a reaction to these changes and uh, the way that they remade, reshaped Thai politics. And interestingly, the complaints in conservative quarters were still about the party system, right? But now it was there were too few parties. The parties become too strong, uh, and you know, references to parliamentary dictatorships and tyrannies of majority, etc. So once again, there are sort of attempts made to, to to engineer a different party system via the 2007 constitution and the 2017 constitution, with the goal of weakening parties, refragmenting the party system, and turning the clock back to the 1980s, 1990s. Uh, and now the 2007 constitution largely failed in this regard, and we can talk about why uh, people are interested. But the 2017 constitution, combined with uh, the, the the coup in 2014, the suspension of parliament and and party activity. Had discernible, uh, uh, had discernible effects on the party system. And the first um, result that we're all aware of is that we do see this refragmenting of the party system with the, the sort of merge of lots of these small and micro parties uh, in the parliament. Uh, we also uh, can pick this up, we again look at this effective number of parties measure. Um, we see a big spike in the number of parties in 2019, not all the way back to 2000 to, to the 1996 or sort of the pre-reform era, uh, but close, right? This, this really dramatic rise in the number uh, of parties. Um, and a number of factors also combine to severely weaken uh, political parties and, and voters' attachments to those parties. So this includes the shuttering of parliament in the end of uh, eight years, uh, end of elections for eight years, right? Bans on parties' act activities during that period. The rise of individual centric micro parties, uh, the rise of these uh, amorphous or pre-electoral party alliances, uh, a Democrat party that was kind of stuck in the middle of the road and bled supporters as a result, uh, the use of inducements by the junta to get politicians at all levels uh, to switch to Palam Pracharat, 
uh, and a distribution of massive amounts of patronage to voters in a bid to, to decrease the salience of what had become the, the, the sort of dominant cleavage in Thai politics, pro and anti-military, pro anti um, uh, toxin, if you want to uh, phrase it that way. Um, so uh, the, the switch to, to in, in 2019 to a single vote makes it hard to use some of the tools we use in other elections to, to see how voters are casting uh, multiple votes. But we do see an increase in party switching, uh, less punishment for party switchers. And in this figure here, again from VDEM, we can see that uh, a marked decline in the perceived institutionalization, the strength of uh, political parties in Thailand. The result of all this is, is that once again, we're hearing criticisms leveled at parties and party systems, and I've been involved with forums and discussions about how to improve Thailand's party system, calls for reform to reduce the number of parties, uh, make them stronger, make them more institutionalized. So um, uh, you'll forgive a sort of, sort of sense of deja vu here. Um, let's so briefly talk about, uh, the, 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 before we talk about sort of efforts to reform things, uh, about the second sort of alleged culprit in this, and this is vultures. Um, in the eyes of many Thai elites and middle class, the problem with Thai democracy is that ignorant, backwards, and moral voters, especially from the North and Northeast, keep electing bad people. They elect the wrong folks, and then when those, those, those wrong folks um, come in and make a mess of things. And the reason that these rural voters keep voting for the wrong side and don't uh, or can't consider programs or policies is traced back in this line of thinking to their lack of knowledge, right? their, their ignorance. Uh, and these sentiments are widely expressed. These are just a few quotes that, um, uh, that, that indicate this, uh, one from Nopokun uh, Lakum. Uh, uh, rural people have good hearts, but they don't know the truth like we do in Bangkok. It's our duty to re-educate them. Or from Sonti, um, uh, there's no e electoral democracy in Thailand, such as one found in the West, because most people outside the middle class lack sufficient knowledge to understand how power can be abused. And probably my favorite from our friend, uh, um, uh, former Prime Minister Prayut, uh, maybe to be to be once again Prime Minister Prayu, we'll find out in a week or two. Um, uh, do gardeners working outside the Parliament's building or farmers know anything about democracy? Of course not. Don't talk to me about citizenry. Those people only go to vote because they were paid. Um, so these are quite egregious examples of this, but the sentiment is, is widely shared. Right? I, I, I get these kinds of questions very often when I present in Thailand, but I want to emphasize this is not a unique Thai phenomenon. Um, uh, this is a common sentiment in almost all democracies. Uh, the, these are two figures. Um, uh, the first, the bottom from Thailand, the top from uh, the Philippines, and it's amazing, um, you know, two different, uh, you know, political cartoonists, but capturing the same idea that voters are sort of being led around by the nose by politicians waving money in their face. Uh, this is the problem. But we see similar uh, complaints about uh, the ignorance of uh, voters who vote for Trump in the United States, right? This is a really common sentiment uh, in, in democracies. And if, what I want to suggest today is that the story is actually much more complicated than these pictures uh, suggest. So first, in our work, we have some evidence that the salience, the influence, if not the incidence of vote buying has declined between 2000 and uh, 2001, uh, 2011, excuse me. Uh, electoral handouts were not the only or even the most important factor driving voter decisions in those periods, as voters came to care somewhat more about party labels and party and policy programs. But that said, we do appear to see something of a resurgence to come back in 2019 of these tactics, um, uh, driven in large part by Palam Prasharat, um, and, and, and something scholars like uh, Vienra, Nitipo, and Napon Ajatu Siri Patak are doing a great work to kind of better map and understand. Um, but 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 there, you know, these these. Um, uh, it's no longer simple, it's, it's, it's a stereotype now. If it, if it was ever true, it no longer is true that this is the only thing voters care about. Uh, the data also show that voters in the Northeast uh, and to some extent uh, the North as well, um, aren't, aren't confused, aren't particularly ignorant, or at least not any more so than voters elsewhere in the country. In fact, they're generally more knowledgeable and more engaged than their fellow citizens in Bangkok or the South. We ask the questions that as flawed as they are, that sort of gets at some of those things. Um, most know exactly what they're doing when they ca are casting a vote, who they're voting for and who they're voting against. Um, and, and that informs their choice. Um, still, the rhetoric, though, is that ignorant backwards voters are to blame and uh, is that the rhetoric is ubiquitous. So that brings us to uh, the issue of constitutional reform or institutional engineering. Um, uh, engineering, institutional engineering is a national sport in Thailand, right? This is, this is, uh, you know, this is a, um, this is a hobby. Um, but, but, and, but the question is, can we engineer our way to better parties? So parties that are cohesive, that are disciplined with, with meaningful labels and clear programmatic platforms. And can we engineer our way to better voters, uh, which I would define as voters who are better able to vote in ways that are consistent with their interests. So when I, as I mentioned at the outset, I'm an institutionalist. I believe in my heart of hearts that institutions are important, that they can, can and do profoundly shape incentives and capabilities of, of political actors. 
And I can and will, if given the opportunity to wax, po I'll, I'll wax poetic about the critical importance of political parties, the ways in which institutions can strengthen or weaken parties, uh, trade offs between different kinds of electoral systems, one vote versus two votes, and dividing by 100 or dividing by 500, uh, and ways in which we can make it easier or harder for voters to vote in their interests. But I want to argue that all of the election system fiddling and all of the voter education attempts are really worthless unless two other things are in place. Uh, and this will be my sort of final big point. Uh, first, elections have to be meaningful and party political actors, politicians, parties, candidates, voters have to develop long time horizons. They have to expect that parties and elections are gonna be around for the long haul. So we know from studies uh, 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 voters and party systems around the world, including some of my own work, that these are, are the two most fundamental factors that shape the incentives to invest in stronger parties and the ability of voters to participate effectively. We want an institutional and political environment that encourages politicians and candidates and, to, and voters to invest in political parties and party building. We want political elites to have incentives to build party organizations, to develop distinct platforms, to construct enduring ties. We want politicians who are willing to stick around for the long term and to sacrifice some things for the party, greater party good and to invest in the party label. We want voters to develop lasting attachments to, to, to parties, to rely on party labels as shortcuts and to evaluate uh, parties and candidates based on their policies and, and performance. But none of those things will happen unless these two conditions are present. Parties and their elected representatives, elected representatives actually have to control the levers of power. So as a politician, why would you invest in par building stronger parties to compete in elections if those parties don't control uh, policymaking? As a voter, why pay attention to party programs, party campaign promises, or party labels if voters don't determine who wields uh, power and if the real power in the, in the political system lies outside of the party system. And then parties need to have meaningful, uh, and people need to believe also that parties and elections are going to be around for the long term without pause or interruption. Again, why invest in party building if you're not certain whether you're gonna be here uh, or whether there's gonna be elections uh, in, uh, in the next cycle? Why as a voter should I pay any attention to parties or party platforms if they are unlikely to last? Uh, so both voters and politicians need long time horizons um, and need to believe that elections are meaningful. Um, uh, so what does this look like historically in Thailand? Well, on the one hand, uh, Thailand does have this long history of elections. So starting, I started my timeline here in 1946, where the first, uh, the first election where parties were allowed. We have lots of parliamentary elections over these 74 years, by my count, uh, 23. Uh, arguably lots of time and lots of chances for parties to figure things out. Uh, in fact, some would suggest that this is evidence that elections, that parties, uh, voters, and ultimately democracy uh, itself are ill-fitted to Thailand's particular circumstances. Uh, um, otherwise, we would have seen stronger parties develop by now. We still wouldn't be hearing complaints about voters who don't know what they're doing. Uh, but let's complicate this Thailand a little bit and ask ourselves uh, what, to what extent Thailand elections have been meaningful uh, and the extent to which political actors actually have uh, expectations that parties are going to continue in perpetuity. Um, so to start with, we know that 1946-1973, we have uh, what I've labeled the bureaucratic quality period here, for lack of a better term. Uh, there was never more than one election in a row without legislators being dissolved, parties being banned, elections being suspended, or all three. Um, uh, so power was generally concentrating in the hands of the military bureaucratic elite, even under ostensibly elected governments. Um, and so not surprising the parties don't emerge here as, a, as strong uh, vehicles. But since 1973, we've had more regular elections. But even over these last several decades, elections were never the only game in town. Um, uh, uh, pol and elected politicians often did not control the policymaking uh, apparatus. So again, um, uh, we could illustrate this in a variety of ways, but here's, here's the periods of time where elections for the House coinc coincided with a fully or partially appointed Senate. Or here is, we could add to that, um, uh, periods where elected governments were still headed by unelected prime ministers who were usually former military generals. Uh, and again, if there's little expectation that election of elected officials are gonna fully capture power, why invest time and effort in building party or policy uh, development if, if you're a politician or, uh, uh, or, or a voter? And finally, we can add to this uh, timeline instances since 1970 where elected governments have been ousted via coups or election outcomes have been overturned. And looking at that timeline, it's not surprising that politicians and party leaders and voters generally have very short time horizons, rarely looking beyond the next election and expect that elections will not be the final arbiter of who controls power, who controls government, who controls policymaking. So to wrap up, are Thai parties weaker than we'd like? Undoubtedly. And while voters aren't the ignorant simpletons that some have claimed, Thai democracy would certainly benefit from deeper connections between voters and parties and more voters holding parties accountable for their, their promises and their, their actions in office. But that said, any shortcomings that we observe among parties or voters are more likely symptoms of the problems with Thai democracy rather than the cause. 
Uh, and, and until those deeper issues are resolved, until elected officials securely hold the reins of power and expect to do so for the long term, attempts to engineer stronger parties or better voters are likely to fall short, sort of akin to shuffling the, the deck, tear, deck chairs on the Titanic. So with that happy note, I'll go ahead and uh, conclude and, and look forward to your questions and discussions. Thanks very much, Alan, for that tour de force through uh, a very wide range of issues that will help us to understand what's going on politically and electorally in, in Thailand. Um, anybody who would like to ask a question, please put your question into the Q&A, and we'll be taking a look at those shortly. But let me abuse my privilege as the moderator of this session by kicking off. So you made a very strong case for the idea that voters are now more knowledgeable. It's not just about money. It's not just about vote buying. Um, party I guess I'm most interested in at the moment, people might be surprised to hear, is Bum Jai Tai, which seems to epitomize what we might call hyper-pragmatism. Um, mm. It's very, we might be able to argue that Palang Pasharat stands for something for people who, who have conservative ideas. It's very difficult to know what a party like Bum Jai Tai stands for, but people are saying this could be the biggest party or the second biggest party and could be the main power broker after the next election, which you have, you've been very restrained in speculating about. And of course, we political scientists hate speculating about things. But I think it's fair to guess that Bum Jai Tai's vote will not go down, that it will still be around in a couple of years. How do you account for the, what we might call the rise of hyper-pragmatism in this larger landscape that you sketch out? Yeah, so that's a great question. So part of this is, um, part of this is actually a, a interesting question that I'm just interested in sort of seeing the results of, right? So, um, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of erosion of uh, the attachments to parties uh, um, uh, over the sort of the eight years and then post the post coup have really been interesting. Uh, and I'm interested to sort of see in this next election, do we see a, a resurgence of that? Um, do we see a sort of, um, uh, um, you know, uh, do, do we see a sort of surge of party loyalties to, to, to various uh, parties in the, in the system? Um, uh, and then how do we account for somebody like Boom, Boom Jai Tai, right? This is, we've, those voters have always existed. So saying that, uh, saying that voters, um, uh, when, I, when I talk about voters become more partisan, this is, you know, this is, this is a large number of voters, but there's still always a sort of squishy middle of folks who didn't have, have strong attachments. So that's never disappeared in Thailand. What that, that, that my sense is that number has grown as a result of uh, actually, as, as, as a strategic, uh, as a result of strategic actions on the part of the junta to try and create these voters, right? To try and disattach them from uh, from uh, from uh, uh, from uh, political parties, but also a, a weariness uh, part of some with the conflict between the um, the big sides. And I think you're picking that up. And also, so there are two dimensions. This, right? Some who uh, who, who switch to parties like Boom Jai Tai. Uh, uh, some who support parties like um, uh, Kwamung Mai or Move Forward, or, um, yeah, you know, who are, um, not, um, uh, yeah, so Anakot Mai or, or, or Move Forward, right, who, who are looking mm -hmm. for sort of different alternatives uh, in the system. So I think it's a, it's a, a reflection of, um, uh, of cynicism and, and disillusionment with the current party system. Uh, um, but, uh, but I'll be interested to see how big that group actually is. Um, I, I agree, it's, I don't think it's gonna shrink at all, but, I, but uh, I'm interested to see its size compared to sort of the other main polls. So yeah, great question. Great, yes, no, there's, there's a lot to be seen, isn't there, coming up very soon. So many interesting questions. Okay, so we've got a few questions coming in. Let me start with some of those. One question who says that they're Singapore born, YY Munsell says, how does party institutionalization currently impact on election results? Um, so the, so that we got, that's a great question and a complicated question, which is why I'm kind of figuring out how to jump into it. Um, so, so we think about uh, party institutionalization mattering in a couple of ways for elections. So first, um, uh, from the Canada perspective, right? Um, uh, how valuable are parties as, as tools, assets to candidates, right? Is this a way for me to connect with voters? Is this is a way for me to communicate lots of information to voters, to coordinate efforts across, um, uh, you know, to, 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 to coordinate our efforts and produce externalities for my campaigning, right? The stronger that the, the sort of parties are, the more institutionalized parties are, the more benefit I get as a candidate for using that as a tool in, in, my, uh, in, in my campaigning. So it, it's, it's useful for me to go into a constituency say vote for me because 
I'm, you know, tall, dark, and handsome. I'm a favorite son of this this, this municipality, or I'm, uh, you know, I, you know I've, I've I've done good things for this area. But also because my party has this has has this reputation or this platform or whatever, right? That 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 could be really useful for candidates. It lowers the cost of campaigning. It allows you to build sort of uh, to 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 take advantage of reputations that are built over time. Uh, and for and from voters' perspectives, it also makes voting a much easier task, right? I don't have to learn the policy platforms of you know, 20 new faces in my, you know, in my constituency, um, I can use party labels as a shortcut, right? I, I know that somebody who is part of, you know, a, a, who's a Democrat in the United States or a Republican, Republican in the United States, that's going to carry with it certain assumptions about the policy or the policy positions, their preferences. Uh, and that makes my, my job as voters uh, much less costly, much easier to make a decision that's going to be in line with my interests rather than me figuring out the backgrounds of every candidate on the ballots in my uh, in my particular constituency. So that's two that's two sort of marked ways that affects the ways in which candidates approach elections and which voters uh, approach their choice of election. Great. Okay, we have a couple of uh, questions from anonymous participants. Uh, one is: so, what are the deeper problems that weak parties are merely the symptom of, and how would we address those? And a second one: I'm glad you're getting these questions instead of me because I'm moderating and not um, not speaking today, Alan. I find it odd that a talk on institutions and electoral politics in Thailand makes no mention at all of the role of the monarchy as an institution, nor includes the decline and replacement of the former king in the timeline of interruptions to Thai politics. Could you, Alan, I? been debating these questions for many years yes could you could you mention that uh, your views on that yeah so um yeah so i could i could add a third sort of a, a you know fourth panel to that slide that just sort of has constant uh you know well at least since 1957 sort of constant uh, presence of the monarchy looming over things um uh yeah i mean so that is um uh you know the uh, the the sort of ultimate symbol of um uh power lying outside of elections, right? Um, and the, the influence of the monarchies have been flowed over time. And uh, um, But um, yeah, so I would certainly just add that to the mix. Um, uh, the, uh, and then the, the, on the sort of first question, um, what are these deeper things? Well, it come, it's, it's, those two, it's those two factors, right? So elections are not the only game in town. Um, uh, politicians recognize and have ample evidence to, and voters to, to, uh, to believe that Electoral outcomes may affect some things we care about, but ultimately aren't going to, you know, may, may not matter in the ways that 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 uh, parties and voters are hoping they were going to. They're they're going to they're going to matter. That uh, that the sort of full sources of power uh, when push comes to shove lie outside of elected office, and that you know manifests in the military and in, in the bureaucracy and the in the monarchy, the sort of uh, the conservative the, the conservative sort of forces in Thailand, uh, and then uh, expectations that. Um, Elections are fleeting. You know, elections and parties are ephemeral and fleeting, right? These, these, these. Um, I, I don't expect these things to last, uh, uh, and and so I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna have really sh a short time horizon. I'm gonna I, I'm preparing for the next election to get what I can while the going's good, and then um, and then things are gonna fade away if my can if my candidate, right? Or a voter, um, you know, and, and and we heard this a lot in interviews with with voters prior to the last election. Um, you know, what does it matter that the outcome is already predetermined? Right. And so, you know, yeah, my, my first preference actually may be a particular party, um, but I don't think that party is going to win. So I, I might as well vote for someone, a different party and get something with that. Right. Um, so those uh, those um, those deeper sort of issues of do do, do, do elections matter. Right. And um, can voters and, and candidates and parties expect to be around for the long term until those two things we can answer sort of unequivocally? Yes. It's really hard to, to, to fix these other issues because those other issues grow out of that fundamental incongruence in, uh, in Thai politics. Great, thanks. Let, the questions are coming in thick and fast, so let's try and get through as, as many as we can. Eric White, a regular questioner in these seminars, asks us, uh, how many Thai political parties have endured for 25 or more years, like the Democrat Party, and what explains their persistence given the political dynamics you've discussed? Great question. So not many. Uh, so basically, the Democrats, uh, and now you know we're getting close to 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 tie our tie, clear tie in terms of its uh, its longevity. Uh, there's there's a, there's a few, um, not many. So what what um, so we we're, we're generalizing from a small number of cases, which always is a dangerous thing. Um, uh, but you know we'd look at um, the kinds of things that scholars who've looked at the Democrat Party, for example, would look at. Um, uh, party organization, right? Uh, an organization that actually exists, and at least. Historically, that may be changing now, but um, 
actually had a viable organization in between elections. No, Alan seems to have frozen on us. Oops. Sorry. Okay. Yes, okay. Back. Now we can hear you again. Yep. <laughs> My end or your end? Anyway. Um, yeah, we lost uh, you for about uh, 15 seconds there. Yeah. I assume that I said something deeply profound and I convinced you <laughs> in that, that little period. Uh, so, so um, yeah, so we, we look at party organizations, we look at uh, repeated uh, competition. So again, one of the things that, one of the ways you build a party and party label is by repeatedly contesting elections and voters seeing you as uh, yeah, being able to sort of um, build on and judge you based on a reputation. And so um, uh, that, so, but we don't have a lot of examples. Uh, and in part, we don't have a lot of examples because of this history of, uh, of shutting down elections and, uh, and, um, uh, and the, the sort of control of policy lying outside of the party system. So not a lot of examples uh, to your mind, Eric, and, and really, you know, interesting to see what was going to happen to the Democrats, the, long, the longest lived party in Thailand, uh, what it's going to, what's going to happen the next election. It did, you know, it, it looks like it's, uh, uh, it's certainly not the robust party that it, that it had been uh, over the last uh, you know, 40 years. So, Great, thanks. Okay, and Jasmine Ann says, could you speak a bit more about what you see as the role of protests, particularly the most recent student protests? I assume the, the 2020 protests are uh, in mind here in influencing the dynamic between parties and voters because street politics has always been a massive feature of uh, the last few decades in Thailand too. Uh, yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, so uh, one of the ways I think about that is sort of helping to define the, the sort of ideological space on which parties have to take a position, right? Um, uh, or at least in, or incentivized to take a position. Some will choose not to, and their, or their, their, their position will be, uh, you know, we're not taking a position. Uh, but sort of to make, to, to, to put on the agenda uh, issues that parties have to respond to and, um, uh, and um, make costly decisions about. Uh, and so where those, where those protests don't happen, it's easy for parties to, to, to talk in, in sort of broad terms. We're all for you know, better developments and, and better democracy and better education. Uh, where protests put issues that are more controversial on the agenda, um, that can force parties to, to, to take a stand and then to dif differentiate those parties in ways that can be meaningful and abusive of voters. So, um, so part, parties have a big, a big role sort of helping set that ideological or, or policy agenda uh, that then parties as part of that environment have to position themselves regarding. Great, okay, the next one is from uh, Triteb Sri, uh, Sri Sangha, who, let me just paraphrase quickly here, basically is saying, if we look at the last election and we saw um, more party accountability because the Democrat party lost votes dramatically as a result of its past performance, perhaps, and we saw future forward gaining in votes because they were more ideologically clear and disciplined. And if that, you know, that was the trend last time, do you think that will change in the 2023 elections? Is this here to stay, this uh, down with the unclear parties and up with the clear ones? Um, so uh, I think it was less, a, so, Yes, on some sort, but I, but I would, I guess, I would, I would add some nuance to the characterization of the Democrat Party. So yes, their policy position was unclear, but it was, it was, um, uh, but there, uh, but but it was unclear on the big issue of the day, right? Um, uh, so, uh, so th they got punished um, with other alternatives in the system that were that you know that were making a clear, uh, a cl taking a clear position on that on sort of core issue in that election. Um, uh, you know, is that Boom Jai Tai, uh, you know, in the, that we to come back there, you know very explicitly does not take a strong position on, you know, they're, they're going to back whoever, the, whoever, whatever horse is going to get, you right. know, get them the things they want. Um, and, uh, um, but that is, um, uh, and that perhaps uh, both is, is, is the cause of their appeal, but also limits of their appeal. Um, uh, so I don't expect them to be punished in the same way that the Democrats have been, because the Democrats, again, had a reputation for coming down on one side of that divider to the other, and the last election didn't send a clear signal about where they stood. Boom Jai Tai, his position has always been, we'll work with anybody, right? And so um, in some ways, the voters who, who like that position will continue probably to like that position and continue to support, at least with one of their votes, um, uh, um, Boom Jai Tai. And one of the things I'm really keen on is looking to see what do those voters do with their other vote, right? So are they voting for Boom Jai Tai at the local level, but casting a vote for um, uh, you know, parties with uh, a more clear sort of uh, ideological bent or, or uh, programmatic bent with their second vote, or are they Boom Jai Tai voters in some more 
intrinsic way. And so that'll be, a, a, that'll be really interesting to sort of see in this next election. Great. Okay, from Julian Spindler, we have non-political actors, military monarchy, business elites, bureaucracy. They've really tightened their grip on Thailand since 2014 and has only moved forward, posing a challenge to this dictatorship of elites. Do you think that Thailand's voters are ready to say no more like their brothers and sisters in Myanmar? <laughs> Um, yeah, I think, well, I think there's certainly a group that is, um, uh, but uh, voters can't act alone. I mean, this is one of the lessons we've had over the last 30 years, right? So voters have repeatedly um, expressed their preferences, uh, um, uh, uh, but, you know, have not always had lasting uh, alliances with, with, with key elites. And so um, I, I do think we'll see in the next election, I'm not, you know, without picking a winner, right? I, I think we'll still see a sizable contingent who is voting what they perceive as uh, a change in uh, um, a change to sort of politics as usual in uh, in Thailand, um, uh, but the space for the, the the space for those parties to then remake uh, the the political system is still really limited. Uh, you know, given the current constitution, uh, given the, uh, the, the the current political dynamics. So uh, yes, I expect that voters and uh, are are going to uh, you know a lot of voters are going to vote for changes and better you know better more extensive democracy. Um, uh, but the, the deck is still stacked against those groups, uh, you know, for, you know, uh, in terms of achieving change uh, via sort of um, a normal sort of institutional political channels. Great. Okay. From Aria Fernandez, the top three parties in the Thai parliament were founded in the 2000s. And what does that mean in terms of party institutionalization? I guess it's like your, Eric's question in reverse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, oh, well, again, it's uh, so first of all, the fact that we um, have some parties that last at the time is, is, is interesting information. Um, but yeah, this is this is a reflection, I think, of um, new incentives generated in part by not not fully, but in part by the, 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 the institutional reforms of 1997 that made um, uh, that, that changed the dynamics and made parties who could who could organize campaign on a national sort of policy platform. Um, gave those parties certain advantages. So parties that weren't able to, to make that switch, you know, uh, do, do le are less successful at elections and parties found with that, with that sort of dynamic in mind do better. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's not surprising that when we, whenever we see sort of critical juncture, whether it's institutions or some of the shock of the system, we often see a sort of, um, uh, you know, a, a death of, old, uh, of, of parties who, who are death of institutions who grew up under uh, and developed under the old set of rules and the emergence of new actors who are able to take advantage of the, uh, of, of, of the shifting incentives. So not surprising. Um, uh, the, you know, the real question, you know, the, if we were gonna rerun history is what would have happened if we didn't have a coup in 2007, 2004, uh, 2000, uh, 2014? What, you know, how would that party system have, have evolved and developed? Um, uh, and, uh, you know, one of the great what ifs, I think. But, uh, um, uh, but yeah, it, it not, not surprising that we would see new actors coming to play uh, uh, post, uh, you know, post reform. Great. The questions are coming thick and fast, so uh, we appreciate your ability, gamely, to keep uh, responding here. Okay. As it appears, we'll soon have the fifth election with a different electoral system in a row. Does regular changing of the electoral system also impact on parties' abilities for long-term development and planning? That's a great question. So whoever asked that, um, it was living in my brain. So when I originally made those, those this set of figures, a timeline at the end, I had a version that had every electoral system change, um, and then it just became a mass of color. You couldn't see anything, right? So, yeah, that though, though anytime the rules change, particularly they change in substantial ways, um, that uh, you know that that's going to recalibrate the expectations of parties, the, re, re, the expectation of voters, um, and, and we know that, that that it takes an election or two to adjust to the new norms, the new incentives of uh, of, a, of a new electoral system. So, the fact that those 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 institutions are being changed quite often from election to election, uh, means that it becomes harder to sort of anticipate, respond to, and build around those, those institutions. So yeah, certainly part of um, the explanation for the, the short time horizon, the, uh, um, uh, the uncertainty on the part of voters and, and uh, members of parties. Okay, what are the future prospects, this is from Phil Hirsch, of party affiliation in local elections in Thailand, and how important is this for party institutionalization? Uh, so yeah, Phil, um, see me in a, in, in in a year or two. Um, the, uh, we're actually we're actually working on this question uh, at, at a, you know at, at right now with a, with a project on sort of local governance in Thailand, um, uh, and um, you know what what what's interesting to me um, about this question is um, 
uh, the sort of the, the, what looked like in the sort of 2000s, the sort of the, 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 the sort of movement towards a nationalization of even local elections, right? Um, uh, that, um, you know, some, some at least uh, some, some movement towards that. So uh, local elections were uh, in, in some ways being fought on similar grounds to, uh, to national elections with, with party identities being very, becoming, becoming more important. I won't say very important. Um, uh, and the last elections um, were, were, you know, it, it seems like we've, we've moved back from that, right? That, I mean, and again, part of this, part of this was, um, a very explicit decision by the by the junta to try and make sure that these elections were you know were fought on different grounds and not fought over uh, these national these national political issues um, uh, through a variety of tools. But I, I'm keen to sort of see how that unfold um, how that unfolds, right? Um, uh, and you know, and part of this is also strategic reaction by and we've been interviewing local politicians, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, mayors and others. Uh, who, who talk about this being a, strate a strategic decision on their part to depoliticize and departisanize as a result of the coup, right? And to, to, to be sure that they're not seen as, um, uh, you know, overtly uh, political or, and certainly not overtly political for the opposition, uh, but to, 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 you know, refocus on service delivery, building, um, uh, you know, building uh, sort of patronage networks and, and local machines, right? The sort of the 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 old style tools of uh, of, of sort of local governance and partisanship has really been played down uh, at least in these interviews. But again, this is early work, and we're still trying to get the sense of things. But that that link between uh, so one of the markers of stronger parties can be um, the sort of uh, the, those party labels traveling down ballot and meaning something at the local level. Um, and there's been attempts to try and do that in the, 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 these recent local elections. My, my sense is those haven't been super successful, but something we're actively trying to understand and get our heads around right now. Okay, great. Now, our previous question is not, not yet satisfied with your answer about the monarchy. <laughs> Alan is coming back to you again. Your only commentary was that it should be added to the mix, but added how, analyzed how, and addressed in what ways, and says, by continuing to not specifically name and analyze the actual sources of power and instead focusing on the epiphenomenal, epiphenomenon sorry, of partisan elections that don't actually matter, okay, a strong statement there, this, risks, this talk risks further entrenching them or shielding them from scrutiny. I'd love to hear the speaker's response to this comment here we are well i'm not sure how much more clearly i can say it, it, you know it matters and then then you know it matters it is it's it's the you know it's the it, it's it's the overarching institution that um from which these other sort of um uh checks on uh on sort of elected and partisan authority uh you know um flow uh and so uh um I, I could have this whole talk be about uh, you know the position of the monarchy. There'd be other problems with that, of course. But um, the uh, it, it is you know it, it is one of the crucial institutions that shape the incentives of a political elite in Thailand and voters in Thailand, and um, uh, and and that, that's one of the reasons. That's the you know part of the argument of the talk. That's one of the reasons why uh, our focus on things that are that are, are I, I still think have importance, right? But but that they they miss uh, if, if we focus on parties and focus on elections and expect those to um, and focus our, our attention on sort of reforming those institutions, we miss the broader context, which includes, crucially, the role of the monarchy in Thai politics um, uh, and, and hamper our ability to actually, um, uh, overestimate our ability to actually uh, make, make meaningful changes to those institutions. Great. Yeah, Alan and I have been still not be satisfied, yes. but that's uh, probably that's... not. Alan and I have been having this conversation for some years. It dates back to an episode quite a number of years ago where I said, "Well, it's only three things that matter: monarchy, and monarchy, and monarchy." And Thailand. And <laughs> at that point, Alan didn't quite agree with me, but he's he's coming closer to my position little by little. Yeah, so yeah, we're, yeah, we're, yeah. we're we're working on it. The data, right? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, another question from Triteb uh, Sanga. Some scholars argue that the key factors to transition to democracy and democratic con consolidation is conservative parties and how they constrain their behaviors within the bounds of democratic procedures. Uh, do or will we see this in your opinion within the Democrat party or Plank Basharat? Yeah, so let me answer that this way. Um, uh, so two of the fundamental power uh, pillars of, of democracy are is um, losers consent, right? So will the, you know, uh, the losers agree that, that the system is still that, uh, legitimate and the the, uh, their opponents um, are legitimate actors uh, in the political system, and uh, and then winners restraint. So once empowered, the winners um, uh, not work to actively punish their opponents. They're going to reward their supporters, of course, but do they see their uh, their um, 
Uh, do they see their opponents as enemies to be destroyed rather than you know, uh, uh, you know um, opponents in a, in a political game? Uh, and one of the things that happens over the course of the 2000s, particularly post or 2005 and six, uh, is um, coming from both sides an erosion of that, that sort of norm uh, that had begun to be built up, right? Um, uh, of sort of loser's consent, winner's restraint. Uh, and so, um, uh, the, uh, so we, we, we do certainly have um, uh, periods of Thai history where um, we've got some you know, losers um, uh, you know, uh, going, uh, going away quietly, but part of this, but, but where we saw this the most was 80s and 90s where there were no permanent winners, no permanent losers, right? Where um, you know, large, these large shifting coalitions. So if I'm not in power right now, I wait 18 months or two years and I'll be in power again. Um, the stakes dramatically change in the 2000s once we get majority parties. And so, and when we get the, the reality of a sort of uh, seemingly permanent uh, winners and permanent losers, and that changes the calculations. And so, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the one, one, one way to sort of uh, get out of that dilemma, right, is to, uh, is to have systems where it's not winner take all, winner take some to give, uh, give losers some stake in the, uh, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the equation and toxins and, uh, and others sort of centralization of power and aggressive, uh, um, uh, aggressive actions towards the opposition helped, helped sort of, you know, helped, helped produce this kind of a polarized environment where I'm either in or out and the stakes are huge. Um, so that, to, to sort of move away from that brink, we have to sort of return to a, polit a politics where um, my fortunes don't entirely rest on my, my um, on how I do this election or whether I'm in power or not, that I have a longer time horizon to expect. I don't win now. I'm going to have another realistic shot of being part of a governing coalition down the road. Fantastic. Okay, they're still coming in thick and fast. So if you're up for it, we can do a few more. Um, sure. Okay, James Wise. In the late 50s and early 90s, military parties attracted support in the first election after their formation, but then faded. Why have military parties not institutionalized in Thailand? And in next year's election, is Palang Prasharat likely to go the same way as earlier military parties? And I think I'm not supposed to answer this question myself, but I, you might also be thinking the same thing. Alan. What is a military party? Because we, we can we can actually debate which which of these parties are military parties. But yes. Yeah, so like in particular. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, the, yeah, I do think there's signs that Palam Prasharat is fraying, and and mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, in, in my discussions with you know members of the party, and uh, you know, uh, there's there's very few who feel deep loyalties to that party as an institution, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, this is, you know, um, yeah. So 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 I I would not be surprised if we see Palam Prasharat, you know, go the way of Samakidam or other you know other military parties. Um, there's a larger question there, James, that I think is a great one, which is why do militaries often find it hard to build lasting uh, lasting parties? This is this is a um, uh, this is a pattern globally. Um, so military regimes are less likely to uh, form parties in the first place, and when they do, less likely to to form institutionalized uh, political parties. In part, that's because um, uh, militaries have other assets at their disposal, um, uh, right? They have a military organization that can that can substitute often for uh, and 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 the uh, the, uh, the the capacity to sort of exert force that comes from those institutions. And so, um, you know, th that that's the institution at hand. That's the least costly institution to actually use. And so, let's use things like ISOC and other and other other tools to be able to um, to mobilize and 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 oppose, uh, you know, oppose those that, that um, you disagree with. Um, uh, and parties are sort of costly when they're formed, end up, end up being a costly sort of vestigial institution to these often, right? Um, the sort of core commitment to the military is to that military institution. Parties, if they do exist, are seen as necessary evils to be able to run an election. And party leaders are unlikely to want to invest a lot of time in an institution that frankly could be a competitor to the sort of core uh, military institution. So that's part of the story there. Um, part of it is also though, um, uh, if you're gonna have a party, you need, you need uh, one of the assets that you need to have, you, have an, you need to have an organization. Militaries are gonna create these, these, these parties out of you know, ex nihilo, right, out of, uh, out of scratch. They often don't have an organizational base and uh, militaries often don't have um, really a strong sort of ideological or programmatic uh, set of policies um, to, to offer voters. And so again, uh, the sort of foundations of building lasting parties are often not assets that militaries have uh, 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 you know, uh, close at hand. Uh, the asset they do have is again, this, this sort of capacity and organizational network uh, that, that is, is in some ways a competitor to a, a strong party. So that's yeah, a great, great question. 
Great. Well, I've only got about five minutes left, and there's still uh, ten questions that people want to answer. I'm going to have to cherry pick the, the questions. I'm going to yes, I'm going to have to cherry pick the questions a bit here, just to focus on things that haven't really come up yet. So one really address directly addresses what you seem to want to talk about. So you might like that one. Um, how is party strength measured? Can you talk about how the data you shared in the first few slides about party strength was gathered and and measured? Um. Uh, I don't know if I necessarily want to talk about this, but I'm happy to talk about it. So, um, yeah, so there's a lot of ways. So one of the things that we do in the work that, that I've been doing with, with Joel and, and, and also on my own is uh, there, there's no silver bullet, right? There's no magic, you know, that this is the indicator that, that tells all, right? So the, the goal is to use lots of different indicators and sort of look to see, do they, do they push in the same direction? So, I, so, so we've used um, how voters uh, vote when they have two votes, right? Uh, through history or two or three votes throughout Thai history and sort of see how that shifts over time. Uh, how candidates running in the same party, how they do, you know, how, so comparing 2007 when there were multiple candidates in each district in the same party, how do those candidates, what do their votes look like compared to what they look like pre-97 with a, with a similar system? Um, uh, looking at uh, the incidence and success of party switchers, right, is another source of data. On the VDEM data specifically, um, uh, VDEM asks a series of questions about party organization, about voters' attachments to parties, about distinctiveness of party labels, um, uh, about what, you know, how, how parties, how, how members of parties vote together in the legislature. Those are sort of the core elements of that um, uh, of that institutionalization, institutionalization index. Um, so it comes out of measures on those dimensions, what, what parties sort of look like. So, great question. Okay, I'm going to pick out questions from people who don't seem to have asked anything yet, unless they're using multiple identities here. Uh, and I'm afraid we are going to end with a couple of these speculative looking to what might happen next questions, which, you know, no session about Thai politics is complete without a couple of these. So Petra Alderman, who we, uh, we know very well, basically asks, yeah, if the Constitutional Court rules against Priyut and, and kicks him out of office, how will that affect playing for Sharat's electoral chances, the thing we're going to know on allegedly now on the 30th of September? Yeah, um, uh, yeah, that's so one of the just as a caveat. So one of the things that Thai politics, um, you know, has has, uh, you know, has, has great ability to do is make make predictions and predictors look like fools. So, um, so with that, with that as a as a, as a caveat, um, honestly, not as much as I think we that, that we might assume, right? Um, uh, uh, the um, it, it matters a lot for some things, but uh, there's all you know, there's there's um, uh, but our youth's popularity is not it's not the highest, and and there are you know there's certainly lots of rumors about members of that of that party um, casting about for other potential standard bearers um, and not not necessarily happy with our youth's leadership. Uh, lots of ways this is this is being manifest. The question though, of course, is is there a clear alternative? Um, uh, is it Prawit? Is it someone else? Um, uh, but um, uh, I don't. Palam I, Pracharat. I, I, so so so, Prayut does not have a sort of. Uh, to my to my to my view, a strong personal following in the way that other members of other part other party leaders might have had or have in the past. Um, uh, and so, um, while he's the face of the party, he's not the soul of the party in ways that other I think um, uh, we, we see, for example, in uh, in other parties in Thailand. So, some effect, but not but but that's not going to make or break Palam Prachara is my is my guess. Great. And Marissa Olson and two others are basically asking the same question about the other end of the spectrum. What's going to happen to move forward? Uh, and of course, as somebody who's been working on this topic with the Future Forward Party project that I did, I'm also really interested to know what you think, Alan. Can they pull this off again without the special circumstances that obtained in 2019? Or uh, are they going to be a shadow of their former selves in 2023? So my guess is closer to the latter than the former. Um, I think they'll still be among the, the sort of set of mid-sized mid parties. I don't think they'll fall out completely. Um, they benefited a lot from the, the electoral system last time, which voters, you know, which gave voters single vote for a party. So the fact that they had in, in many parts of the country fairly unknown weak candidates didn't hurt them. And an electoral system that based, you know, the seat allocation only on that party list vote um, that that really was a boost to this new party that didn't have a, electoral machinery that that you know was being powered by a set of uh, you know a set of ideologies and ideas that that many voters found found um, uh, attractive and uh, you know some some powerful personalities at the top of the party that people were um, were energized by. This is going to be a harder election for them, right? So they, they you know as as the, their their sort of 
their, their difficulties in local elections show they, they, they have not yet built a strong local base uh, that would propel them to victory in a lot of the uh, constituency uh, races. I expect they'll still do you know, uh, decently in the party list election, but that party list election, uh, because of, you know, because the decision to go with um, the unlinked lists, uh, the, un the, un the unlinked tiers and the, and the 100 seat as a denominator, uh, does not carry the weight that that um, that uh, the old system did. So it, it hurts parties like uh, a move forward who would likely do better in that system. So I expect them not to do as well. I don't expect they'll disappear, you know, as a, as a, as a sort of mid-sized player, but, um, but, but, but less but not 81, pressure. not 81 seats. Yeah, that, that would be my guess. Right. Great. Well, thanks, Alan, for your uh, willingness to answer so many questions so succinctly. And so I think we've addressed about 16 plus questions, which is something of a record for these, these seminars. Uh, there are many questions we could continue to debate and quite a number of others still there, uh, another seven or so that we haven't got to, some of which are similar, some of which are different than the other ones. But this has been a really fantastic session. So I think everyone will join me in thanking Alan Hickam very much for speaking to us today about the uh, the twists and turns of Thai politics and what has been going on and what may happen next. Thanks very much, Alan, for a, a, a very stimulating Thank Thanks, seminar. Thanks, for, for a great set of questions. Appreciate it. And people are going to will be willing, welcome to reach out to me if they have further questions. And how should they reach you? It's um, um, easiest is at ahicken at umich.edu. Yep, umich, U-M-I-C-H dot. Yeah, okay, great. Thanks okay. so much, everybody, for Thank joining us and hope to see you all in the next one. Take care. Bye-bye.